Hi everybody, so today we're going to look at the strategy and tactics of using a Farseer in your Eldar army. I'm going to go through all the options, going to go through all the uses of him, uh, strengths, weaknesses, things to consider, um, all the different versions, you know, on foot, on a jet bike, uh, special character, and uh, hopefully that will give you some understanding of uh, some uh, some ways to use them. And hopefully for veterans that are watching this video, it might give you a few more ideas for things you haven't thought of before. So without further ado, let's get into it. Okay, so let's talk about his stats and abilities. Uh, first of all, he has a full-on Eldar stat line. Low toughness, low strength. Good initiative, good weapon skill. We're talking weapon skill 5, so he's going to be hitting most things on 3s that are you know not character-based. And he's got an initiative of 5. It's pretty good. He's going to be going faster than most things. What does he carry? He carries some very important gear. First of all, he has a Witch Blade. Now, this model looks like he has two Witch Blades. I don't know why uh, GW modeled it this way. There's no possibility to actually give him two Witch Blades. I think it's just for coolness value. GW modeled it this way. He has one Witch Blade. He has a pistol, shuriken pistol, so that means he gets a bonus attack in close combat. Plus, he has a pistol he can shoot. Um, he has no armor, but he has a 4 plus invulnerable save. So, uh, no armor, but he has got invulnerable, so generally he's got a 4 plus save against most things. Uh, unfortunately, of course, he's going to get insta killed by a lot of stuff. He's only toughness 3. Anything that's strength 6 or higher is going to insta kill him. Got to watch out for that. Um, he does also come with a ghost helm for free. A ghost helm is a very intriguing item. Normally when you take a Perils of the Warp, you take an automatic wound, no armor allowed, and if you have an invulnerable save, you have to re-roll successful saves. The Ghost Helm, uh, before you even have to roll for Perils, after you've taken a Perils of the Warp, automatically stops the Perils on a 3+, on a roll of 3+. That is not a save, so you don't have to re-roll that if you succeed. It is simply a roll, 3+, on a d6, you stop the Perils of the Warp wound instantly. Very useful ability for, um, you know, makes Eldar uh, a, a very safe race to use psychic powers with. Also, other things will cause perils of the warp on you. Remember those missiles that Grey Knights have that cause instant perils. 3 plus stops it right away. Um, in terms of his abilities, uh, he's got fleet of foot, like most other Eldar, so he's fleet, which is uh, pretty helpful when you put him with a unit that is fleet and is fleeting its way into combat. And uh, generally speaking, you know, he is a solid HQ, he's very cheap, uh, but he gets expensive quickly. You know, at 55 points, uh, but he, you're not going to leave him at 55 points. You have to give him abilities, you have to give him powers. His powers are expensive, um, so he is going to end up costing you usually between 130 and 180 points, uh, the, way, the way you kit him out. The last important thing to remember about the Witch Blade is that it is a very unique item. In close combat, it wounds any... Uh, any model that has a toughness value automatically wounds it on a 2+. plus. So pretend that it's almost like a, uh, a poison 2+, plus ability. It does not go through armor saves, unfortunately, but it does wound on a 2+, plus always. That means against a toughness 8 creature, it wounds on a 2+. plus. You know how it goes. Um, against vehicles, it counts as strength 9. So this, it's extremely powerful against vehicles. You get in against a vehicle, any hit you get is probably going to penetrate most vehicles. Uh, pretty nasty. So uh, very important, a very good, good very good weapon. Okay, let's talk upgrades. The first upgrade you can do is give this guy a singing spear. Now, a singing spear, so this could, for instance, model as a singing spear, for instance, um, uh, is like a witch blade. So it also wounds on a 2+, plus, not a power weapon. It also counts as strength 9 against vehicles. However, it gains the ability to be thrown. You can throw it 12 inches. It's allowed to be thrown 12 inches uh, as an assault weapon with strength 9 against vehicles. Um, so that's pretty, that's pretty good. It's not an AP, uh, a high AP weapon at all, but it still counts as strength 9. So you might be able to, for instance, blow up a, uh, a Storm Raven that's nearby. Pretty useful weapon. So it only costs 3 points to upgrade. And you think, well, why wouldn't everyone just upgrade from a Witchblade? The reason is that the Witchblade counts as a, cl a single-handed close combat weapon. The spear does not. So you lose an attack in close combat if you go for the spear. So that's the trade-off you do. Three points to upgrade for it, but uh, it costs you an attack in melee, because here he has pistol plus, uh, plus witch blade. Of course, again, you don't see it here, because his pistol is hidden underneath his cloak, and he's actually wielding a second witch blade, but uh, 
He actually only has one Witch Blade and a pistol, so that gives him an extra attack. Next upgrade uh, is one of the most powerful anti-psychic defenses in the entire game, Runes of Warding. So what do Runes of Warding do, and why do you, do you always see Eldar players take them in tournament lists? Normally when you roll for a psychic power, you roll two dice. You test against your leadership. We've rolled an eight, so if the guy's leadership was eight or eight or less, he would have succeeded. Um, Runes of Warding forces your opponent to roll a third dice. So suddenly now, he's now failed, because there's no way that 16 <laughs> passes a leadership check. Plus, he's also taken to Perils of the Warp. Um, now, uh, how does this uh, item work for Perils of the Warp? If your opponent rolls and fails, um, fails his roll in any way, shape, or form, so here he rolled a 3 dice, he rolled a 4, 5, and a 3, that's a 12, so it's obviously a fail if his leadership was 10. But now, every time you roll 12 or higher, you also immediately take a Perils of the Warp as well. Very, very nasty. This means that even though he didn't take an official Perils by rolling, you know, like two ones and a six or two sixes and something else, he still takes the Perils because he rolled 12 or higher. Extremely powerful item. Uh, stops better than, uh, more than 50% of powers because the average roll on three dice is 10 and a half. Now this one got lucky. But the average roll is actually 10 and a half statistically, so slightly better than 50-50 to stop all powers. And very importantly, the runes of warding work on the entire table. It is not limited by a 24-inch range like psychic hoods are, or like uh, certain other defenses are. It's one of those old abilities that goes across the entire table at all times. Extremely powerful. If you don't take this, this item for 15 points, runes of warding, in your competitive army, you're insane. You're literally insane. I mean, it's the most effective psychic defense we have. Um, the next upgrade is Runes of Witnessing. Kind of interesting, similar item. Runes of Witnessing, normally, you know, this guy has, is able to use one psychic power, has leadership 10, roll two dice. Perfect, wow, what luck that I rolled and I actually failed. Perfect example. Normally you roll, and he would have failed now. He rolled an 11 instead of 10. Doesn't happen very often, but he would have failed. Runes of Witnessing allows you to always roll a third dice. Always roll a third dice, throw away the highest. Suddenly, this guy rolled a nine now, and actually passed the psychic power that he would have failed. Very impressive item, 10 points. Some people think it's not worth taking because your leadership's high enough. Fuha is what I say, man. It, it just makes it more certain. I don't like uh, having a probability of succeeding. I want to be almost guaranteed to succeed on my powers. Especially in Elder Arm, you need those powers to go off. So I take Runes Awarding almost every time, worth it. Now, one thing to think about, Runes of Warding actually increases your possibility of getting a Perils of the Warp. It makes it much more likely that two out of your three dice are going to be ones, and the other dice can be anything, right, to succeed. Your power will still go off, but you're going to take Perils. Now, that's still not a problem, and I'll tell you why. Because of your Ghost Helm. Your Ghost Helm stops 66% of all Perils. So even though, though you've marginally increased your chance a little bit of having Perils, because you're rolling that extra dice, always throwing away the highest, um, you've actually, you're still well below the chance of, of having perils go through simply because of that ghost helm. Take the runes of witnessing if you want your powers to succeed. The next upgrade to the uh, Farseer is it allows him to cast a second power, and that ability is called Spirit Stones. It, fu it functions essentially like a level 2 Psychic Mastery. Don't be surprised if any future codexes, uh, the, uh, you know, just refers to it as level 1, level 2. Basically, this guy's a level 1, normally, he's able to cast one power. With Spirit Stones, he can pa uh, cast a second power. A pretty useful upgrade if you're planning on, you know, making your Farseer kitted out. The last upgrade you can do is you can put him on a jet bike. Here I have my custom-made uh, Farseer on jet bike because there's actually no model that uh, exists for you. You have to kind of custom make your own. I've actually made some parts from a Dark Eldar bike, other random Eldar parts, all that kind of stuff. Um, and uh, this costs, uh, it, it's a reasonable cost. Uh, what does it do? The jet bike is actually pretty spectacular. It gives him a 3 plus armor save, gives him a twin-linked strength 4, range 12 assault gun instead of his pistol, makes him move fast, gives him the, the sort of cheating Eldar movement in the assault phase where you can move around stuff. Pretty good, key, a good piece of kit if you have other stuff in your army that is uh, going to be uh, flying around. Okay, let's talk strategy. Why do you put this guy in your army? Why do you choose him as your HQ over the other options? Simply put, the Farseer is kind of the backbone of an Eldar army. It's a support figure. 
I mean, clearly his stats are not that good enough that he's going to kill your opponent, you know, your opponent's army on his own. He's not, you know, a uh, a skull taker. He's not some kind of, you know, a sp you know, space marine special character. I mean, he's there to support your army. His powers make your entire army better, and they they screw over your opponent's army. Uh, you know, how do they make you better? You can re-roll your armor saves potentially with fortune. You can doom your opponent's unit that needs to die, make it so that you re-roll wounds against it. You can snipe important characters like a psi cannon out of a unit or like a, a an orc power fist out of a unit with mind war you can uh, you can do ranged uh, you know area attacks with the uh, eldritch storm i mean blast like you know a storm on the guys that that hits them you can have it affect vehicles with eldritch storm although it's not as good against them um you know you have a lot of different power options i mean you, you also have guide which you know the, the key thing with guide is to re-roll i mean you got a unit of fire dragons or a unit of war walkers and you need to, you want to make sure they hit re-rollable uh, hits against something, spectacular. A really big effect, especially on the right types of units that are going to cause damage to your opponent. He's a force multiplier, that's what we call in 40k. Something that makes other things exponentially better than they actually are. That's why you take him. He supports your army, he's the backbone of your army, he lets your army uh, kick ass way, way above its uh, sort of level that it normally would. Okay, so let's talk about psychic powers, but before we go into discussing each of the individual psychic powers, uh, let's talk about timing. When do you use those powers? Two of the Farseer psychic powers, Mind War and Eldritch Storm, are shooting attacks, so you use those in the shooting phase. You try to save one of your uses of your psychic powers that you're allowed to do if, well, first of all, you're allowed to use one power. If you have uh, Spirit Stones, you can use a second power. You have to save it for the shooting phase, and then that's when you use it. And remember, you can only ever do one shooting attack. That includes firing a pistol, shooting a Mind War, throwing out a uh, Eldritch Storm. Those other three powers, Guide, Fortune, and Doom, all must happen at the beginning of the Eldar player's turn. Not at the beginning of the movement phase, not at the beginning of the shooting phase, not in between the movement phase and the shooting phase. It happens right at the beginning of the turn. It's the first thing you do. So remember always, your powers are the first thing you do at the start of turn. What does this mean? This means if it's a Dawn of War scenario, um, you know, you have an HQ and, well, these guys are not troops, but let's pretend for this purpose they're, they're troops. Or, you know, even if you're maybe not Dawn of War, but if you're just coming on from reserves, you cannot use your powers because you are not actually on the board yet. You have to be on the board at the start of your turn to use Eldar powers. This means if it's Dawn of War or if you're coming on from reserve, you're not going to get to use your powers that turn. You have to be on the board at the start of your turn to use it. Which is why in many battle reports you'll see me, even in Dawn of War, I'll start someone like Eldrad or my Farseer on Jetbike, I'll start him on the board with some random troop choice uh, as protecting him just so that he can start his powers, so he can have his powers uh, get rolling right away. Very important. So, you know... Um, uh, uh, reserving something that has a Farseer in it, not the greatest strategy, because he just will not be able to use his powers uh, on, you know, on that turn that he comes on, unless they're shooting powers, but a lot of the shooting powers are pretty average, in, uh, you know, which we'll, we'll, we'll talk about in a second. Okay, let's talk psychic powers, starting off with uh, you know, a, really, a real doozy of a power, Doom. What is Doom? Doom is a psychic power that when you pass your test, within 24 inches, any unit that's within 24, not even ones that you can see, you do not need to see the unit. They can be hidden behind blocking terrain, doesn't matter. As long as they're within 24 inches at the start of your turn, at the start of your Eldar turn, your army will now re-roll all wounds against the target unit for the entire game turn. That means your turn and your opponent's turn. That means your shooting phase, your assault phase, then your opponent's assault phase. I mean, you are going to shred anything you put that onto. It's going to let you blast things to smithereens, beat them up in combat. You know, it's an amazing, amazing power. The beautiful thing about that power is you cast it once on one unit, and potentially your entire army can benefit. Because as long as it's a unit that needs to die, maybe it's a huge unit of purifiers, you fire three or four units at it to really wipe them out, it makes all of those units better for a single cast. Amazing, amazing power. Reroll all wounds. And, you know, in, uh, in team games, it still works because all it says is that people that attack that unit get to reroll wounds against it. So, you know, it's um, all hits caused upon the unit cause uh, are rerolled. Amazing, amazing power. 
Um, very worthwhile. If that's the only power you take, I, I recommend it. If you're only taking one power, take that power. It makes your entire army better. It makes your shooting and your melee combat phase better. The next power we're going to talk about is my personal favorite, uh, just because of what it allows you to do with your army, and that is Fortune. Fortune allows one unit within six inches of this guy at the start of the Eldar turn, after he successfully passes the test, to re-roll all saves. And that lasts, again, for the entire game turn. It lasts for your turn, lasts for your opponent's turn. Very important. So, um, you know, what does that mean? That means that these guys, even though they only have a 4 plus armor save, suddenly have a statistical better chance than as if they were, had, uh, were to have a 3 plus save. That means that if this guy takes a shimmer shield, they have a 5 plus re-rollable and vulnerable, which is actually better against power weapons than if they had a 4 plus, uh, re you know, uh, just a single 4 plus and vulnerable save. Amazing things. Truly amazing things start to happen when you combine that re-roll with things that have a 3 plus armor. Warp Spider, right? Crappy toughness, good armor, but still not good enough if you're taking if you're taking a hail of fire. Suddenly his three plus armor is re-rollable. That actually triples his survivability. It doubles survivability for four plus, triples it for three plus. I mean, these, you know, a unit of these guys with fortune needs to take an unbelievable hail of fire to lose models. Amazing. You know, it gets even more spectacular when you start including things like uh, you know. A, a, a seer council or like warlocks on jet bikes i mean these guys will have a three plus re-rollable four plus and vulnerable re-rollable amazing and it gets to stratospheric levels when you talk about wraith guard which have also a three plus armor save but also a, a toughness of six so not only is it hard to actually get wounds on these guys but then they are re-rolling their three plus armor and if they have a warlock in the unit with conceal they're re-rolling their their you know their cover saves god forbid if they're in normal cover i mean they're going to be real and tough nut to crack. Fortune just makes a lot of Eldar armies and units playable because otherwise you would just die really quickly. You know, out in the open, a unit of 10 of these guys, not very hard to gun down. With Fortune at least, though, and gaining their armor save, getting maybe a cover save, they can actually survive a, a couple of turns of getting shot at. These guys, super expensive, you know, they'd get blown off the board with ease every time if it wasn't for the fact that they can potentially be fortuned. So, you know, Fortune really makes a lot of things much, much more survivable. It gives the army some resilience. And something else that needs to be stressed is that the reroll from Fortune is on all saves. This means armor saves, this means invulnerable saves, this means cover saves, you know. If you've got, uh, if you've got cover behind, uh, behind a building, you know, uh, you know, let's give a better example. You've got, you know, an Exarch left over surviving over here. Some guys are shooting at him from behind this building. And, uh, you know, he's been fortuned by the farce here. That, you know, and this guy has some kind of, uh, maybe it's a psi cannon, let's just say, would have normally, you know, on rend through his armor. He's going to get a cover save. That's going to be re-rollable if he has fortune on him. So, you know, every kind of save. This also applies to vehicles, because uh, vehicles sometimes can just regularly gain cover when they're 50% covered. So, you know, here we go, a guy firing a psi cannon at this guy. Um, this guy's, you know, 50% covered behind that, that thing there. If he had been fortuned that round, maybe the Farseer's inside, he's going to reroll that cover save. Similarly, when a vehicle goes flat out, so you go 18 inches or more, the uh, flying skimmer, you're going to gain a 4 plus cover save, which, if you had fortune at the start of turn, is going to become rerollable. You know, that is the, the wonderful power of fortune. It makes your entire army potentially more resilient, at least the most important units in your army on any given turn. Now, a little bit of a mention at how fortune actually works. Let's just say you've got the Farseer with a unit of these guys and you want him to fortune the unit. He fortunes the unit, he can fortune himself, or he can fortune the unit. It won't matter because the entire unit, when they're joined together, counts as a unit. They will gain fortune. So he casts fortune once, this unit has fortune. Um, and, and that's the way it works. Now, if you were to leave that unit, believe it or not, the rules right now are not actually very specific. Theoretically speaking, if you wanted to be a real jerk, because these, you know, this guy casts it once, the whole unit gets it, he would leave have fortune, give it to some other, you know, potentially some other unit. These guys could join with a different character and potentially they're going to be fortune. Now that is, I don't want you to get me wrong, that is not how to play this ability. That is not how to play it. It's pretty much very unsportsmanlike. You know, it's really abusive. Um, so you don't want to play it that way. Generally speaking, the way uh, GW tends to, uh, to, tends to view it and opponents tend to view it is they're happy with you, for instance, taking fortune with you to a different unit, but as long as you're very clear where the fortune is and where it isn't. So if this guy were to cast fortune here, and then in the middle of the movement phase realizes, ah, man, I want to join these guys instead, 
you can say that he's taking it and putting it on this new unit now. That's fine, but then these guys would lose it. Or you can say he's not taking it with him and instead these guys are keeping it. That's fine too, but just be very clear about where it's going. Um, you know, if your opponent tries to, uh, tries to call shenanigans on you, just, you know, just bring it up to them that theoretically, because of the way the rules are worded and because it has not been clarified, you could actually give fortune to a million different things. These guys could give fortune over here. He can get fortune over here from a single casting. I mean, it's, it's pretty crazy what can happen. So you're actually being very, very kind and very sportsmanlike by just sort of specifying where the fortune is and, uh, you know, where it's going to be given. Keep that in mind. Now, the range on fortune is very important. It's only six inches, only six inches. You know, you might be over here. This unit is seven inches away at the start of your turn. You're not going to be able to fortune these guys. Very short range on fortune. There's some ways to work around that when you're inside a vehicle because it sort of extends your range a little bit, but uh, just because of the size of the hull of a vehicle. But you got to be very careful, very careful with your positioning to make sure your fortune is going off correctly. If you're fortuning these the warp spiders and they're, you know, the fortune at the start of one turn, they jump away, gun something down, well, you might want to yo-yo back using the warp jump move so that you're going to be within six inches to get refortuned. You know, keep that in mind. Very short range on fortune. Now, the next psychic power that is, uh, you know, really crucial to discuss is guide. Guide is a very powerful uh, ability. What does it do? So, again, six inch range, like fortune. So you got to make sure you're nice and close to whatever you're going to try to fortune. We got our farseer up here. These dudes over here, these war walkers, primary target for being guided. What does guide do? Allows you to re-roll to hit with any shooting weapons on the unit that you fortune. So these poor bastards only have a ballistic skill of three. You know, I don't know, I do not understand why in an army of aspect warriors you put your guardians, your your, your mooks inside to pilot and fire your most important guns. But such is the Eldar army, apparently. So these guys, even though they have 24 shots coming out of this unit, strength six, all of them they're going to miss with about half of them usually. Suddenly when you fortune it though, they're going to be actually hitting with three quarters of their shots on average with that re-roll re -roll to hit. Amazing. I mean, these guys are going to eviscerate this unit. And, you know, on a unit like this that has so many strength six shots, being able to re-roll is amazing to hit. Uh, you know, guide also great on a unit of, uh, of fire dragons. You know, depending on what kind of situation you're in, maybe you need these guys to blow up Land Raider. The, the real problem is usually hitting rather than penetrating armor of like a Land Raider, a Lehman Russ, you know, like even just like a Chimera or something. Rerolling to hit, these guys are almost all going to hit. Pretty amazing. Great power. Now, um, uh, some things to remember is, again, that six-inch range only. So it's got a pretty short range. Uh, it works on vehicles. However, it has no effect on things that are twin-linked. So if you have a Warlock here, and he's got his twin-linked twin -linked, uh, Shuriken catapult gun there, it's already re-rolling to hit, so guide has no effect whatsoever, so it's useless on something like that. So save it for things that have no re-rolls and uh, low ballistic skill. really ups their shooting power. The next power we're going to talk about is Mind War. This is a very interesting offensive shooting power. Uh, it breaks one of the most sacred rules of targeting in 40k that your opponent is allowed to allocate the wounds. Now, the way this power works is you pass your psychic test, you pick any unengaged model. That means cannot be in close combat, has to be unengaged, within 18 inches of you, and it cannot also not be inside a vehicle. If they're hidden inside a vehicle, the power will not work against them. You can't target the model. You pick that model. You just target the model. So in this case... I'm going to pick the guy with the Psy Cannon. I want to see that Psy Cannon dead. Now, normally, if I shot a pistol, I'd only be able to put made maximum of one wound here, and my opponent could allocate it away to some guy that doesn't have the Psy Cannon. Mine were instead. I pick that model. After I've successfully passed my, my leadership test, we both make a leadership check. Leadership of 10, add it. I only got a, 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 an 11. Leadership of 9, add the dice. Oh, he only got a 10. Wow, so he actually failed. 11 versus 10. Any number that your opponent uh, fails uh, in terms of have, rolling lower than you by, he takes that many wounds, no armor allowed. This guy would be instantly dead in this scenario. Um, now, you are allowed to take a cover save, so if there was, uh, if there was cover in the way, if the, unit had, if the unit had mostly cover, you know, like there's a little bit of a... Actually, that's not the best way of doing it. Like this, the, he's over here, the unit has cover against him, there's two guys behind the wall, there's this guy, I can see, he would take a cover save. Um... 
He would take a cover save. You get invulnerable saves against him. We don't get armor saves. This makes it an, ext an extremely useful power for targeting out those crucial models in a unit. For instance, the Psy Cannon, gone. Uh, Orc Power Fist, gone knock out those characters uh, against another Eldar army. Oh, dear God, the, the, the pain of being Eldar. So no, against another Eldar army, what happens? You target the Exarch with all the upgrades for the unit. If you successfully mind war him, gone. Just dead. You know, amazing power. It's also good against us uh, individual special characters. You got another librarian over here. You pass your psychic test, you get through his hood, you guys roll off. You got, uh, you know, you roll a 12. He rolls an 11. Wow, so he actually takes a wound right now. If, for instance, you rolled something high, he rolls a five, you rolled, you rolled a five, he rolled a two, You're t he's taken three wounds, suddenly now he's got to take three invulnerable saves. I mean, if he's got a four plus, man, he could just be dead. So this guy's dead. He rolled a one, one save, two fails. He's just dead. So you can actually cause a ton of wounds on this. I mean, I've had uh, battle reports where I managed to blow up a Carnifex instantly from, from, from full down to zero because his leadership is so low and then if you roll high enough you're going to kill him. Pretty powerful uh, use, uh, potential use over there. Um, you know, uh, pretty, pretty solid power. The last power we're going to talk about is uh, Eldritch Storm. Very interesting power. How does it work? You pass your psychic check and then you, uh, you gain a shooting attack. So this is a shooting attack. So just like Mind War, uh, you can't, you know, you can only f ever fire one shooting attack per turn. So you can't do the both this and Mind War. You can't fire your pistol and do this. Shooting attack. You pass your psychic check. You, you now gain an attack that's 18-inch uh, template. can be placed anywhere within 18 inches. It's the large blast. It's a pinning weapon. It's strength 3, AP nothing, however. So, you know, let's just say this was three guys. You know, your pistol could only ever kill one guy. This might be able to kill three guys. You still have to roll to hit with it. That's been clarified in the most recent FAQ. You do have to roll to hit after you've succeeded on the check. But, uh, you know, your Farseer's Ballistic skill is pretty high. It's usually five. So, I mean, even if it scatters, it probably won't scatter away too far. And uh, against infantry, yeah. So, strength three, no armor, uh, no armor piercing. You know, unfortunately, that's the way it goes. But uh, it really good against swarms and things. And it does have an effect against vehicles. Against vehicles, instead of being strength three, it actually becomes a 2d6 plus three roll against the vehicle. So theoretically, it could actually penetrate a land raider. Mind you, you need to roll boxcars to do that. And you need to hit with a dot in the center. But it has a chance to penetrate armor. Unfortunately, it's still AP nothing, so it's going to roll low on the damage table. However, it also has a very strange effect. You eventually, when you hit a vehicle with it, any vehicles that are hit, you roll a direction dice. And you spin the vehicle to face the direction that you rolled. So uh, I don't actually have a direction dice because someone stole it at my last game, but let's just say I've rolled the dice and it's pointing this way, the vehicle spins to point this way. If, it's, if you roll it and it's pointing that way, the vehicle spins to point that way. Really strange and unusual. It might, you might get lucky and uh, you know, if you have like, uh, some vehicle like a Lehman Russ, suddenly get it to spin so that the rear armor is facing your army. I mean, you know, some interesting uses. Not the most useful of the powers, but potentially useful you know, if, 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 you, uh, you know, if, if it fits your army. Now the question then becomes, which powers do you take? You can only cast up to two powers a turn, and that's only if you buy the Spirit Stones, and you have five potential powers. Uh, which ones do you take? You know, it's, it's a tough choice. I would say the most useful power overall, no matter what situation you're playing in, no matter what army you play against, is Doom. I mean, 24-inch range, almost always is going to be useful once the, the battle gets going. Um, it always lets you re-roll your, like your entire army could potentially re-roll against one target. It's always going to be useful because killing things is always useful. Um, if you can only take one power, I mean, take it, you know, take that power. Um, fortune is extremely useful as well. It's a tough choice between the two of them, so I often take both because fortune makes things playable. These guys, I don't really feel are that playable without fortune. With fortune, though, there's some real nice tricks you can pull off with these guys, man. Pretty solid unit. Uh, fortune means a squad of Dire Avengers with a uh, power weapon Shimmer Shield Exarch suddenly is extremely survivable in melee, whereas these guys would normally get pulverized in melee. Suddenly they can take on you know, a couple of purifiers that are surviving from a, from a unit and survive if they have a rerollable and vulnerable save, if you've kitted out the right way and you've got defend going. You know, really important power. Those are my top two, I would say. Uh, the next really great power is Guide, as we talked about. Now, why do I say Guide is less important than the other two? Because it only works on one unit, 
it does not have an effect on certain things in our army. Anything that's twin-linked, for instance, a guy on a jet bike, or a turret on a, uh, on a wave serpent that's already twin-linked. You know, the only thing you're going to twin-link, or you're going to re-roll here is this gun if you upgrade the other gun. Otherwise, the normal gun that goes down here is already twin-linked as well. So it doesn't necessarily work in all such scenarios. It only works on one unit as well. So one unit gets to fire better. I mean, this is a perfect example of a unit that's worth guiding. But uh, other units, uh, you know, like these guys hit on three pluses usually already, even if they're blade storming. Yeah, a guide will help that a lot. But I mean, do they really need it as much as they need to survive with fortune? I would argue in most cases, no. Still an amazing, amazing power, no doubt. But I would say, you know, in the hierarchy, fortune and doom are, to are, are top. Guide is sort of second tier. Now, let's talk about the third tier of powers. Now, keep in mind, I'm not saying these powers are not useful. They absolutely are. I'm just saying, given the fact that you can only cast up to two a turn with someone like this, they are less uh, crucial than those ones that are uh, tier one and tier two. The first one we're going to talk about is Mind War. Awesome power. Uh, we just talked about it. it. lets you snipe, you know, important unit leaders. Maybe there's the one guy carrying the power fist. Oh, that, that feels good to snipe that guy out, right? It lets you maybe insta-kill characters because just put so many wounds on them just from, from an 18-inch range that they just their heads explode, right? Um, pretty, pretty awesome that way. The problem is, is that it's unreliable. It is not a guaranteed power. So even if it goes off, you know, those other powers, sorry, I've got my cord over here because I'm running out of battery power. Those other powers, when they go off, they go off. This power, it goes off, then you still have to roll off the dice. Well, if you're going against something that's really important, like a, uh, you know, another character, he probably has the same leadership as you, 10 and 10. And if he rolls, you know, a 6, you can't even beat him no matter what because you, you have to beat him, his total. If he rolls a little bit low... You know, well, you still got to roll pretty well. I mean, what happens if he rolls a five, you roll a four. Even if he rolls, you know, a two. If you roll a one or two, that doesn't help you. I mean, it's, and even then, he still gets cover save, still gets invulnerable save, not guaranteed. Even against, you know, this guy over here, you do, have, you do have an advantage. This is a great situation because that guy's leadership is only nine, yours is ten. But even then, you know, you roll a one, he rolls a six. It fails. One of your two powers, only two powers that you can do for the entire turn, comes down to a d6 roll. That is why it is less reliable than the other ones. Fortune, when it succeeds, that's it. It's on, you know? And God forbid you have to still get through psychic, uh, you know, psychic hood. So fortune, then you got to get through a psychic hood. Well, this one, you succeed. Then you have to get through a psychic hood. Then you still have to do the stupid roll off. It's just not consistent enough to be a top tier power. However, it is potentially useful in some, situ uh, some situations. And of course, the last power that we're talking about is... Uh, is Eldritch Storm. Why is this the third tier power? Because um, it's not super high strength. After it succeeds, you still have to hit with it. It has some interesting effects, but it doesn't really go through armor. Um, it doesn't really have a great chance against vehicles. You need to roll spectacularly high to really hurt a vehicle. And, um, you know, there are better things in this, in this, in the Elder Army that can blast, you know, lots of Toughness 4 guys or Toughness 3 guys that aren't going to take up one of your crucial two powers per turn. So, you know, it's an okay power. I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to say don't take it, but I mean, you know, it's, it's low on the consideration. Now, something to think about, another tactic is, uh, you know, using the Farseer, adding him in because he has the Witchblade as a way for a unit to deal with vehicles. For instance, you have a surviving unit of Dire Avengers here. These guys have no possible way of taking on vehicles other than trying to shoot the rear armor a, a rear armor maximum of 10 and trying to glance it. If they're in melee against a walker or a vehicle, they, they can't do anything to it. However, now you've added the, uh, the character here, he's got a Witchblade. Strength 9 against vehicles. Very effective. So you've, you've, you know, by adding him to a unit that cannot deal with vehicles, he can help with vehicles. Okay, let's talk about how vehicles interact with psychic powers when there's a, you know, a Farseer inside a vehicle. A Farseer is inside this falcon. It could be a wave serpent, but right now we've picked a falcon. How do you measure powers? How do you even use powers? Now, first of all, none of the Eldar vehicles have any firing points whatsoever. One of the drawbacks of playing Eldar is you're never going to get to shoot weapons out of your vehicle. This means you cannot use Mind War, and you cannot use Eldritch Storm, because they're both shooting attacks. And shooting attacks in the basic rulebook specify that you have to be able to see your target to use them. Uh, the next... Uh, issue is that uh, when you're inside the vehicle, the other three powers, this means uh, doom, this means fortune, this means guide, those three powers luckily do not require line of sight. They have no stipulations that require line of sight. So what does that mean? That means that you can cast them through the vehicle walls. This guy is so much of an awesome psyker that he just senses through the warp these guys here, or this guy here, or those dudes over there. 
and he's able to use those powers anyway. So that means when you're inside a vehicle, you can cast powers, uh, oh, those three powers you can cast. And how do you do it? You measure from the hull of the vehicle. So actually, that gives you kind of a nice extension to the range of your powers, because the hull of the vehicle is pretty big, you know? If, for instance, these two, two units are a good 16, maybe 18 inches apart. There's no way that if you just had a Farseer standing here, he'd be able to catch either unit if he was in the middle. He'd have to pick one unit to be next to. In a vehicle, however, suddenly, these guys are now six inches from here. This guy's six inches from here, potentially, if they're about, you know, 16 inches or something away. So you can cast Fortune on these guys. You can then cast maybe Guide on these guys. Or you can cast Guide on this guy and Doom those guys because you don't need to see them with Doom. So that's how it works in a vehicle. You always measure from the hull of the vehicle. When you're, uh, a lot of times what you might also want to do is if you have a small unit of guys inside something like a Falcon and you unload them, leave the Farseer inside. He likes to just sit around inside a vehicle, not be touchable. Uh, you know, he's not that amazing in combat. He does help a little bit in combat, but he's not that amazing. And he can actually do more for your army when he's inside a vehicle. So, you know, those guys, un you know, these guys unload, do something. He stays inside to be nice and safe because he's only toughness three and still casts his powers. Now, something to remember about, uh, you know, those powers and vehicles. Now, I, as I said, you can cast powers from inside a vehicle, like, for instance, Fortune, Doom, or, or Guide. However, it does not extend vice versa. If there's a unit, another Eldar player, you're fighting against him, he's got some stuff inside the vehicle, you cannot cast into the vehicle. Even though you don't need line of sight, you're not allowed to doom a unit that's inside his vehicle. If this is, you know, one army, this is his opponent, he cannot doom that unit, it's inside a vehicle. That is a general rule that uh, GW has for all types of abilities. You cannot affect things inside vehicles. They don't even count as if they're on the board. Um, and that's a good rule. That's a very good rule. You shouldn't be able to doom stuff that's, in, that's you know, that, you can't even, that is inside a vehicle. I know that theoretically, you know, that he should sense the same way through the warp that he does, but it just makes for too many broken combos. So keep that in mind. Okay, so we've talked about the basic farce here. Let's talk about the one figure that, the one farce here that opponents love to hate and Eldar players love to field. That is the special character farce here, Eldrad Ulthran. Now, you see a lot of competitive lists with this guy. I mean, you see me use him all the time. Yeah, I gotta admit, he's a bit of a crutch. I, I do like what he brings. And uh, there's a reason for that. You know, because of internal balance issues in the Eldar Codex, the Farseers are a little bit too expensive, Eldrad's a little bit too cheap, it makes him a real no-brainer choice in a lot of armies. Assuming that you are already about to bring a relatively expensive, tricked-out Farseer, you know, we're not talking just like a Doom Seer with, like, just Doom and nothing else. We're not talking about, you know, a, a Seer with, like, one or two powers. And we're not even talking, you know, we can't talk about a guy on a jet bike, because you, you can't put Eldrad on a jet bike, right? But if you're just bringing a foot, uh, you know, a regular Farseer just flying around, uh, you know, with a bunch of unit, with a unit or something in a vehicle or just on foot, you really have no reason not to upgrade for a few extra points to Eldrad. Eldrad is so cheap that if you add up all the Eldar gear, he has, he has all the Eldar gear. He, he's only a few more points expensive than if you were to take a regular Farseer and give him every power, every bit of gear, everything. He's only a few more points more expensive, but he's so much better in many ways. The first way Eldrad is better, he has a toughness of four. Toughness of four, that cannot be stressed enough. Toughness three, a strength six shot kills him instantly. A strength seven kills him. A monstrous creature punches, one punch gets through, dead. A monstrous creature like a hive tyrant hits Eldrad, gets through his invulnerable save, he doesn't care, he's got two more wounds. Yeah, that's how badass this guy is. Toughness four. Next huge issue. Still no armor, but has a three plus invulnerable save. Wow, that is an unbelievably massive difference. When you fortune a four plus invulnerable save, that's, you know, that doubles your survivability. When you fortune a three plus invulnerable save, that triples it triples your survivability. Imagine a, a Hive Tyrant having to put 27 wounds into Eldrad. That's how many wounds he has to put into him to statistically have a chance of actually killing him when Fortune is active. Unbelievable. The next issue with him is he, his Witchblade that he has. Well, he actually has a Witchblade. He also has a staff which behaves like a Witchblade in that it always wounds on a 2+. plus. However, it's also a power weapon. It's a power weapon that wounds on a 2+. plus. Amazing. Absolutely amazing. This guy alone can tie up characters and rip through them over a few combats. Because he has a Witchblade, he can also uh, smash into vehicles. You know, Strength 9 against vehicles. 
I mean, the guy's a, the guy's a thug. He can kill vehicles, he can kill characters, he can survive the against The last things. important thing to know about Eldrad is that his staff allows him to use a third power every turn in any start of turn when he's not engaged. So not only do you have spirit stones letting you use two powers, but now your staff lets you use a third power, and that power is allowed to be a power that you have already used. This means you can do two fortunes. You can do two guides if you want. You can uh, doom two units. I mean, amazing. Normally, you are not allowed to use the same power twice. It's right in the rules. FAQ even clarifies that further for people. But Eldrad is allowed to break that sacred rule. That is why people <laughs> you know, hate him. He's got so much uh, support going on. He's the ultimate support piece for your army. What does that mean? That means that Eldrad can, you know, fortune two units. He can fortune a unit of Wraith Guard that he's inside, and then he can also, six inches away, fortune a uh, unit of uh, Warlocks on jet bikes. Fortune them both. And then still doom something, you know? It means that he can, for instance, doom two enemy units and then fortune his own unit. It means that he could fortune a vehicle that he's inside and fortune his own unit inside the vehicle so that if that vehicle does get busted, if it does get killed, the unit will instantly be fortune the moment they pop out. You know, that's one of my favorite tactics, you know. He can, uh, you know, the only thing you can't do is you can't do, for instance, Mind War twice. You can't do two um, Eldritch Storms because those are shooting powers. They can only be done once. Another reason why those powers are lower tier because, you know, uh, you know Eldred's not going to be doing two of them. And you can do some amazing things. I mean, he can, for instance, fortune a unit, doom something, save his third power to Mind War somebody, you know. I mean, it's... Amazing what you can do with him simply because you're allowed to use that third power and you're allowed to cast at least one power that you've already cast. You know, two things fortuned, amazing. Two things doomed, amazing. You know, one thing fortuned, one thing doomed, and suddenly a, uh, you know, unit of war walkers guided, three powers. I mean, good God, you're really supporting your army. That's why Eldrad is so popular. When you add up all the gear that he has, he only costs a few points more, yet he gains all those benefits. Better toughness, better invulnerable save. Um, he has the runes of warning for free. You know, he's got the power weapon that wounds on a 2+. plus. He still has the witch blade. I mean, the guy is a thug. He's a real thug when fortune succeeds. Unfortunately, my, my guy is so much of a thug, he's apparently beat someone to death with his, uh, with his sword over here, and it's become chipped. Actually, that's one of the reasons I've put him on a larger base. Normally, he's on a smaller base, but uh, he just kept falling, kept chipping. This uh, staff has busted so many times. He's at least a little bit more steady on a base like this. Um, you know, that is Eldrad. I mean, uh, it's, it's hard to go back once you've started using this guy. The only, you know, drawbacks to Eldrad are, first of all, he is 210 points. So if you wanted to have just a cheap Farseer with just a, few, a couple of abilities, you know, he's, he's going to be a lot more expensive. You can't put him on a jet bike, so you have to, you know, that, that's one drawback, is that if you want a guy on a jet bike, you have to just get a regular Farseer. But other than that, he really has no drawbacks. I mean, the guy's a thug. Toughness 4 alone with a 3 plus invulnerable, I mean, that, that, that's, that's worth like 50 points. I, I would pay 40 or 50 points for that, but he just gets it. Pretty awesome. Let's talk weaknesses. So the first weakness of a Farseer is that he is ultimately just an Eldar guy. He's just like a fancy Eldar model, so his stats have low strength, low toughness. He can be instant killed very easily despite having three wounds. I mean, those three wounds on this guy are highly theoretical, let me put it that way. When you go into combat against a unit, you know, you're facing it as some kind of unit, maybe that has a power fist, you know, let, let's just say one of these guys has a power fist. If that, guy, if that power fist survives, he's definitely going to put his attacks onto this guy. Because if, if that power fist hit gets through and wounds him, it's going to insta-kill this guy. If it fails his, you know, fails his saves, he's going to be dead instantly. So toughness three, a real pain, real, real problem. Or if, you know, some guy fires a bunch of strength six or higher shots at the unit, so many wounds that actually every guy has to take a wound, you have to allocate onto this guy. He fails that save, he's dead. You know, a big weakness, a lot of points. He's your main HQ, and he could just be insta-killed by a power fist. Next weakness <clears throat> to really consider is um, that... Next weakness to consider is that, you know, he really relies on his psychic powers. Yes, he has a Witch Blade. That does help a little bit in melee. But if this guy's in melee, you know, he's, he's close to being insta-killed by a power fist, that kind of thing, usually. Um, is that because he's using psychic powers, enemy psychic defenses will really have a powerful effect on him. For instance, Psychic Hood, you know, for free. Librarian, Green Knight Librarian gets a free Psychic Hood within 24 inches. If I try to cast my powers... Hey, I gotta just test you. We roll off a d6 at our leadership. Whoever you know, if he beats me, he stops the power. 
Now, what does that mean? That means that the Psychic Hood, with a, a, with a Leadership 10 character with a Hood against your Leadership 10 Farseer, it's only going to succeed at stopping your powers about 40, 43, 42% of the time, something like that, like somewhere in the above 40% range. So that means it's still in your favor, but, you know, not that amazingly in your favor. I mean, when you're talking about a unit of Warlocks on jet bikes, without Fortune, they are the most useless thing in all of 40k, honestly. With Fortune, though, they are very, very nasty, very resilient. But what happens if your one casting of Fortune fails because of the hood? You now have an incredibly useless 400-point unit that's probably just going to just get cleaved down. Get, get, actually, rather just get shot to pieces by, you know, by bolters and things. Um, so you got to watch out for the Psychic Hoods. Those Psychic Hoods will hurt you. Now, you do have an advantage in that. Um, our Psychic Defense goes across the entire table. His only goes 24 inches. If I can stay out of his range, I can, I can fortune my guys, I can guide my guys, um, I can doom things that are out of, you know, a different part of the table, and he has to get closer to me. And then one, the moment he's close enough to me, to Psychic Hood me, you know, he still has to deal with my, uh, with my uh, runes awarding. So something to think about. Okay, so final thoughts. Um, you know, as HQs go, uh, you can't get more seminally Eldar than a Farseer. You know, uh, Eldar's all about combined arms, all about using your abilities, uh, multiplying the effects of your army, using the right unit for the job, and his support powers make that possible. It makes your army work better overall. He supports your army in an exceptional way. Um, if you, you know, he's not going to be the, the biggest thug on the battlefield, absolutely not, unless, of course, you take Eldrad, who is one of the greatest characters in 40k. I mean, this guy just does everything. Um, hard to kill, you know, hard to take down, uh, a real great investment. And even a cheap regular Farseer will add a lot to your army. Even just a regular Farseer with, you know, Doom and Runes awarding it, that's less than 100 points. I mean, that will massively impact the effectiveness of your army. You know, so, uh, so that's it. So I hope you guys enjoyed this video, and, uh, you know, keep playing, keep watching.